Guys, welcome to the I Love Seville Show. My name is Jerry Miller. Thank you kindly for joining us on a Wednesday. We're very grateful for your viewership and your listenership on a gorgeous spring afternoon in the Commonwealth. Of course, we're live in Charlottesville, Elmore County, Central Virginia. The Commonwealth and the country and the world on the I Love Seville Network. Today, we're presented by Skuma Boutique Dispensary. Our friends at Skuma Boutique Dispensary are opening a second location on 420, April 20th on Ellywood Avenue. Our friends at Greenberries, the longest running coffee roaster and coffee shop in Charlottesville, are giving you an opportunity to win free coffee for a year. Judah, if you can get that on screen, our fabulous director, Judah Wickhauer, enter.greenberries dot com enter dot greenberries dot com for a chance to win coffee for a year thanks to greenberries so today's program i'm pumped about um, we have had a chance with this program to get to know viewers and listeners um, as they share their perspective on the shows we do and some of them vanessa park hill comes to mind carol thorpe comes to mind kevin yancey kevin higgins John Yornalis, James Watson, Ray Cadell, to name a few, come to mind, routinely make the program better. Today's guest, Danny O'Day, is one of the best of the best. And as we connected through direct message on Facebook, we realized that not only is this guy um, a community stakeholder, but he's just a positive asset and a positive force of great energy in our community. He's a published author. He got his book published and we'll let him tell the story during a pandemic. And he follows the news cycle as closely as anyone. Scott Aaronworth in Virginia Beach, you're another that fits this Danny O'Day mold. Scott Aaronworth might be the, uh, the biggest foodie in Charlottesville and he's an Esquire in Virginia Beach. Now Judah Wickhauer is our director. If we could go to the two shot, my friend, J-Dubs. And let's welcome DOD himself, Danny O'Day, to the program. A, good afternoon. Um, B, great to have you here. And, and C, I cannot wait to see where this interview goes because you, my friend, are as well read as we are and, and, and can, um, is the word pantof, what's the word, pantoficate? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, on, on a number of different topics. On a number of different topics. First, good afternoon. Nice to have you on the show. Well, Thanks, Jerry. And I've got to say, um, you know, part of the way I stay informed is watching the show. So I really appreciate that. Um, well, thank you. Introduce yourself to everybody that's watching. Hey, everybody. My name is Danny O'Day, uh, local to the community for the past 15 years. Uh, recently published my first novel, The Last Man in Cleveland, uh, available from, from Curious Corvid Publishing. Uh, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Bluebird Bookstop in Crozet is going to be hosting my first live author event on April 28th at the Mud House in Crozet, Virginia. That's unbelievable. I got a, he was generous and kind enough to give us um, the novel here. I have it in my hands. Give us, without any spoilers, because I'm going to read this from start to finish, I promise. Um, give us the uh, synopsis, the elevator pitch of the book. Absolutely. So it's set against the backdrop of the 2016 Olympics, uh, while a small uh, and increasingly devastating plague begins to spread around the world. Uh, I know that might be a little bit of a sensitive topic for <laughs> our viewers today, um, but for what it's worth, I finished it in 2019, and it was a sensitive topic for my publishers as well. <laughs> you finished the book about a pandemic before the pandemic started. That's right. <laughs> that's How, right. I mean, that's just eerie coincidence? Yeah, my, uh, my editor wants me to stop writing speculative fiction, just go into very happy children's stories now. <laughs> <laughs> Dude wrote, I mean, he's like Nostradamus over here. He has a crystal ball. What was the uh, influence uh, or the impetus or the foundation for the book? It's a great question. Um, so it covers a lot of topics, and foremost in those topics and those themes, uh, it covers grief and, and how people deal with loss. And much like a disease, grief and, and pain can spread in that way, in a way that's kind of in the air, in the ether, not something that you can feel or touch, but has a very strong impact in your life. And so my idea was to use a disease uh, as someone might use a metaphor, and then became a little all too real, not, not that long after. 
When did you start realizing, oh my gosh, I'm writing a book about a pandemic and a pandemic is amongst us? I mean, were you like, this is, this when, is getting creepy? <laughs> when uh, all the publishers that I was talking to very quickly started sending me, uh, you know, it looks great, but maybe another time sort of emails. <laughs> That's what I started realizing. So give us, the, give us the flip book. How do you get it from brain to keyboard, screen to publishing house? That is a gr another great question. Um, most important part of the process is to have people around you that you trust to read early drafts. Uh, you're never going to be super happy with the first thing you put on a page. Uh, when I started this book, it was, it was three chapters. It was a short story. I wasn't sure if I had something or if I didn't. Uh, and I had a, enough of a support network, enough of very, very good friends who read it and said, you know, there's something here, but you need to keep writing. And from there, I was able to grow and grow and grow uh, until I was able to get in contact with um, Alan Brown, who's my editor. Uh, and he was the first person who was like in the industry of literature who really believed in it. And he helped me, uh, he helped me turn into what it is today. That is awesome. Um, this guy's a millennial. This guy grew up in the area. This guy went to the College of Women Mary. Mm -hmm. Ray Cadell is watching the program. He just hammered the like button. He says he's listening while on the road. Scott's in Virginia Beach. Wild Bill McChenzie, hello and welcome to the program. If you'd like to give Danny O'Day some props, put the comments in the comments section and I will relay them live on air. We have a couple questions coming in. Um, this is from Grayson who routinely watches the show and Grayson says, is it more difficult now to publish a book post-pandemic than prior to the pandemic? If so, why? That is a great question, Grayson. Uh, so over the course of the pandemic, a lot of publishers stopped uh, basically giving advances. They stopped, um, they stopped really investing in new works and started doubling down on already established authors. Uh, and in addition to that, during the pandemic, uh, it kind of slipped under a lot of people's radars, but there was a pretty big reshuffling in the publishing world. A lot of the smaller houses were purchased by pretty significant ones. Uh, Simon & Schuster and I want to say Macmillan were trying to have a pretty massive merger. I think that got shut down kind of recently though. Um, but basically it's all becoming very, very centralized into what are known as the, the big four publishers. It's like Simon & Schuster, uh, The Hatchet Group, Penguin Random House, uh, names that you would recognize that you would see on the spines of books pretty frequently. Um, and as a result, uh, they tend to really focus in on kind of what's been done before. There's not a lot of room for new voices, not as much as there has been in the past. Uh, they're not as willing to take risks on those new voices as they were in the past. Um, but the flip side of that is that there has been a wellspring of really, really interesting indie presses, uh, including the one that I was fortunate enough to be, um, to be accepted into. That's amazing. Um, do you... Do you, so like with the internet and with digital, we have the democratization of so many creative spaces. That's right. We certainly saw the democratization of music. Yeah. Um, a musician now can become a superstar. I'm, take Justin Bieber. I hate to reference Bieber, but <laughs> Bieber became known because of his prowess on YouTube. That's right. And then as he was publishing covers or, 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 or cover, singing covers, Someone noticed him, and now he is one Usher, of the... Usher, right? Yeah, Usher's another one, okay? Yeah. No, so, Usher picked up Bieber. Yeah, Usher's agent picked up Bieber. That's Usher nice. was a part of, I think Usher found Bieber. So where I'm going with this is, is that same democratization of music, is it applying to the written word and publishing as much? I could absolutely see that happening in the near future. I will say that... Uh, the most supportive people in the industry are other small authors. Uh, they are the best resource. Uh, if you're trying to become an author, they're the best resource that you can be a part of. Everyone who is involved in writing like it, understands that it's an exercise in, um, in compilation. It's an exercise in collaboration. It's an exercise in vulnerability. And you have to be able to lean on a network. So there is, to some extent, certainly that trend in the industry. Um, but at the same time, there has been a great devaluation of it because anyone can sit down with an open word document and put their thoughts on it. Um, and because everyone can, uh, there's been sort of a flood in the industry of 
it's kind of hard to tell like what is going to be the quality content and what isn't. Um, and whereas, you know, in, as recently as 2002, you could make a living writing 15 pieces for Vogue a year. Uh, now you would probably get like 500 bucks a piece. What was it in 2002 for 15 pieces a year? There were there were staff writers uh, who were making $200,000. Dang. Yeah, for like Vogue and Vanity Fair writing like long, long form pieces. Um, these magazines that you know, still exist and still see huge profits. But the pinnacle of the profession. Yeah, it was probably late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. I mean, and now you said it's 500 a clip? Now you, I mean, they're, they're paying freelancers almost nothing. I mean, it's moved a lot online. Like the industry that used to be Vanity Fair and Vogue is now BuzzFeed is now, uh, you know, all, all the online magazines. And there's a reason why a lot of those newsrooms are starting to like unionize and are seeing massive layoffs because there's not a lot of protection out there for the just author, the freelance author, the indie author, there's not a lot of protection. Okay, I love this. Um, so before launching the business 14 years ago this May, I was um, a writer, I made my living yeah. writing. Um, newspaper writing, magazine freelancing, yeah. um, content for public radio, scripts that I would have to write, copy I would write, and then broadcast. So I, I can speak from some firsthand experience on this. This is what I'd like to throw to you. Sure. In 2022, mm -hmm. okay, you're 26. That's right. You're 26 year old. The world is your oyster. Um, you're an entrepreneur in the writing space. I think that's a fair description. That's you're right. An author. It's, it's a okay. small business. Be an author. <laughs> how do you how do you scale and turn this into a living? You got a beautiful, wonderful girlfriend. That's right. I believe you got a pup that you guys <laughs> share together. That's right. Okay. So how do you scale and turn this into a legitimate career that could potentially lead to uh, purchase of a home. We'll get to millennial and housing here in a matter of moments. How do you scale this business? That is um, the million dollar question, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm sure you have ideas. Yeah, yeah. So the most important thing right now, believe it or not, uh, is still word of mouth. Like you need people who read your book to say, that was great. I'm going to tell my friends. Um, the Amazon algorithm, and <laughs> don't get me started on the Amazon publishing world, it's, it can be pretty tough. Um, they, they require 50 uh, reviews of a book to make it onto their trending lists. Um, that helps you get promoted, that helps more people discover your work. Uh, and so what happens now is that there are like these, these networks of indie authors who are exchanging their books and, and reading and learning from each other on how to, on really how to grow your business. Um, I've got a friend of mine who uh, works out of San Diego and his entire profession is helping authors get noticed, uh, helping authors get onto the trending page on the best selling list. And uh, it's, it's a huge market right now. Like they, people are out here trying to make a living with it. Uh, and it's, it's difficult. It is definitely difficult. Is the future an author like you that's going to develop a massive following utilizing books as a way to keep the personal brand in the mainstream mm -hmm. and then utilizing the, the hard copy book to then create a, a, um, a, a vehicle of traffic or readership to a website, and that website is either backed by ad positions mm -hmm. and or a paywall? So social media is more important than it's ever been, okay. is what I will say, is that um, the website is critical. Like I, I have a website, um, I have social media pages that are author dedicated. Uh, but more than ever, um, there's like an under, uh, a subculture uh -huh. uh, on the internet for literature. There's Bookstagram. I don't know if you're familiar with this. No, or please. Bookstagram. Um, and BookTok. Uh, they're the two big ones right now that drive people to books. And they can, if you can get like your book trending on uh, Bookstagram or BookTok, get a lot of these people whose essentially their entire job uh, is to review books online. And these people are really trusted voices. They get 10, 20, sometimes 100,000 followers on Instagram. And all they do is just read a book and tell you what they think of it. And these people can turn the tide of an author's life. Um, like some really respected authors who've been working a long time have recently seen their first you know, New York Times, number one. Someone like um, 
The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. Um, I haven't read it. I've heard amazing things, but I know that she's been an author for like 15 years. Uh, and this book has been the number one book uh, for like the last year on the New York Times, the number one novel. And it's because it was picked up by a lot of these bookstagram reviewers and book talk reviewers. Um, it's also because it's supposed to be an incredible book. I'm sure the quality of it is out of this world. But that sort of subculture really drives engagement. Um, it's really important for it. So I, you know, you and I share a number of commonalities here. We love the written word. We love creating the written word. We love the spoken word. We're content creators. That's right. And as someone who's in the content creation business. We understand, as do you, as does Judah, that when content is quality, mm -hmm. eyeballs, listenership, and viewership will follow. That's right. And when eyeballs, listenership, and viewership follows at scale, mm -hmm. advertising dollars will then follow. It's a straight up formula. Yeah. Formula we <laughs> utilize in, as, in our other business, the advertising agency. Enhanced brand awareness creates more customers, creates incremental revenue. Yep. So could we potentially say Danny O'Day Enterprises or Danny O'Day LLC? That's essentially right. what you are. Yes. You're, you're a businessman. I am. Literally, <laughs> like Jay-Z said, I'm a business man. Okay? So Danny O'Day um, LLC. Could we build, could you build a brand on a website and through social that then could be supported with ad dollars or have a paywall or a Patreon that folks would fund? Have you thought of that? I have, and that is, uh, that's a model that a lot of authors are following these days. It was actually, uh, did you know, do you know John Green, the author John Green? No. Um, the Fault in Our Stars, Looking for Alaska. Big, big young adult fiction writer. Okay. Uh, he was essentially the first person to like pioneer this. He did it on Tumblr, believe it or not, uh, back in like 2008, 2009. And he garnered such a strong following on Tumblr and then on YouTube. Um, his YouTube channels got like 10 million subscribers. Like they, they, they're doing a great job over there. Um, and really the key is just now more than ever, authors need to be engaged with their audience. Uh, it's something that is really, really important is that you're continually interacting with the people who are reading your work, who are sharing your work, uh, who reach out to you. Um, and honestly, like there, there's a part of it that, uh, that like I've been doing recently. Um, I'm doing a, a thank you letter campaign. It's anyone who purchases a copy of my book. There's a little form on my website that you can go in, fill out your mailing address, and I will write you a handwritten thank you. Uh, and the truth That's awesome. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and the truth of it is like, um, you know, part of it is sure, you're like, yeah, I love being able to interact with my audience, but also there's just like such an overwhelming sense of gratitude when you finally are able to get your content out there, you know, and people are reading it. You know this better than anyone, man. Like you, you are always so gracious to the people who are viewing your show. Um, but you. like there is just such that, that feeling of like, I am saying something that people care enough to listen and it, it means so much to someone who, um, who really just, just wants that, you know, who wants to be able to be creating content. Very well said. Very well said. Um, so what is the, what's the future, do you think? Is the future, so the book is called Last Man in Cleveland. I have it on in my hand. Judah, if you can get it back on screen, he's rotating the cover of the book on screen for those that are watching the visual portion of the program. It, is the future more novel, more books? Or is the future short stories? Is it freelancing? Are people reading shorter than longer these days? Uh, <clears throat> I would say that people tend to be reading shorter than longer. Um, my book is 250 pages, but it's manageable. It's it's a very yeah. it's a quick clip. Yeah. Um, and I wrote it because I know that that's the kind of book I like to read. Uh, and I'm honestly I'm betting on a lot of other people feeling similarly. Um, but the truth is that the future of authors I think is in the um, it's what's being called as the multi-hyphenate. Uh, something that I'm sure as an entrepreneur, you come across a lot of people who are 12 things, right? Um, and it's being a novelist, and it's being, um, you know, and it's being a podcast guest, and it's being a speaker. A keynote speaker. And it's being a keynote speaker, yeah. yeah and it's being 
uh, a freelancer. TV show writer and a freelancer yeah. and an independent journalist and 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 uh, and I think that's the future of um, I really do think that's the future of you know really engaged writers. You look at someone who's working right now like uh, like Phoebe Waller Bridge. Uh, someone who started writing a a short play for a local festival in England, uh, and is now you know rewriting the Bond movies and won six Emmys a couple years ago, and is in Star Wars. Someone who really, as recently as eight years ago, was starring in a one woman show uh, on in a local film in a local stage festival. Um, the future is in the multi hyphenate. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. I'm learning from you. So do we think... Uh, I love where this is going right here. Yeah. Um, do you think the brand that you develop and create is a brand specific and personal to Danny O'Day? Or is it a brand that could be more um, broad in category? Mm. So should an exit ever happen, you could sell it in an easier capacity as opposed to a brand associated with your name. For example... For example, um, I learned this with, we talked about this earlier, uh, or prior to the show through DM, um, helped launch youthsportsnow.com. That's right. Exited that business. It was broad category. Charlottesville Restaurant Week, exited that business, got good paydays for those. Right. Um, learned um, by being a broadcaster on NBC29 when the brand was tied to me specifically, mm -hmm. um, it was, it was, much more labor intensive mm. because when the show is the Jerry Miller show and you have to take vacation, it's hard to find someone to sit in and fill in. But if the show is called Varsity Lights, you can find somebody to jump in and take the seat. So what, what are your thoughts? I'm just getting entrepreneurial with you and brainstorming. I love conversations like this. Me too. Me too. Um, I feel like I'm learning a lot too now. Uh, the truth is that I never imagined it as anything other than Danny O'Day. Uh, I, I try in all aspects of my life to be as authentic as I can be. Um, you know, for a couple of reasons. One of which uh, I, I just <laughs> I just don't have the energy to pretend to be someone I'm not. Um, I, I really don't. I, I have as much energy as it takes to be exactly who I am. Um, and as a result, like I, I've never you know tried to market it as um, you know this is the last man in Cleveland show. Uh, it's always been like, this is who I am, and, and I made this book. And all pieces of my work are going to be uh, steeped in, in Appalachian history and probably going to touch on some part of the Irish-American diaspora and are probably going to you know, care a lot about community and family, the things that I care about. Um, but from a purely business perspective... Um, there is a lot of value in being able to create something that you can then say, okay, like it can run itself now. I'm good. I can step away. Um, if I want to come back in the future, like the Atlantic. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, like a brand like that. Exactly. That champions other micro brands authors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, something like, something like, uh, like Axios yeah. right now. Uh, cause, uh, what's it? Why, why can't I never remember his name? He split from Politico. Okay. They found Axios. Um, they've got a phenomenal brand. You know, they're, it's, it's very short, digestible pieces of news. And right now they're investing in like 50 cities, 50 mid major cities across America. Have you seen this? I have not. Uh, so is that, uh, is it Jim Vandy Hedge? Mike Allen? Vandy High. Vandy High. Okay. Yeah. Vandy High. He split from Politico uh, a couple years ago. And, they um, recognized a gap in uh, in journalism, and that is that you know the, the local regional journalism is kind of dying across America. Like the patch idea. Exactly, exactly. And so now they're putting offices in the Baltimores, the Richmonds, the Houstons of America. It's not just in the DCs and the LAs and the New Yorks anymore. They're caring about St. Louis and they're caring uh, about Omaha, and like that's where they're opening their new offices. Um, and as a result, like if, say, they wanted to take a super hands-off approach in Richmond, they know that they've got, you know, beat workers there. They trust those people and they say, okay, you know what, you guys do your thing. Uh, and so there's a lot of value in being able to create an, um, an iterable brand, something that can, you know, kind of replicate itself and then run itself. I mean, because all you would need would be um, a responsive, 
mobile responsive, desktop responsive website. Yep. Infrastructure, digital infrastructure that you can white label to the market of choice. Mm -hmm. And then a bureau chief in each market that has three or four freelancers under the bureau chief. Exactly. A couple of... Uh a couple of beat writers that know the area, that know a couple of politicians, a couple of people who are insiders, and boom, you've got a functioning office, got nine people in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you make of the, um, so I remember first job out of UVA was um, as a staff writer at The Progress, Daily Progress. Wow. Um, and I remember I was, I was I paying ten, $10 an hour. Um, and I was working nights, weekends, and every holiday. Um, <laughs> Remember Sounds like a staff writer. <laughs> leaving, remember leaving home in Williamsburg to sprint to Charlottesville for a 4 p.m. shift on Christmas Day to put the paper to bed on Rio um, here in the city of Charlotte, in Almar County, actually, Rio Road. Yeah. Um, so I'll throw this to you. What do you make of the slow demise of print journalism? It's it, disheartening, isn't it? It really upsets me. You know, I love print journalism. I think I've picked up every copy of Seville Weekly for the past three years. Um, I think I've read every Crozet Gazette that's come out. And I love it because I can look at it and open it up and be like, oh, I know Carol, I know her. She wrote three articles in the Crozet Gazette this month. That's awesome. I wonder, uh, I wonder what she wants to talk about. Or you know, I know the, the Blue Ridge Gardening Association is doing a special on uh, like local, local um, environmental like growth and I would love to hear what the gardeners have to say about it and that kind of journalism I think is is critical for any sort of community um, I mean studies show it's obviously not a causation but a correlation between um, you know lower crime rates and a robust local infrastructure uh, for journalism they show studies that um, more honest politicians more honest politicians man and robust journalism like we need people who are talking to our city managers and our representatives and our board of supervisors and saying hey why are we spending eight million dollars on this new project like what's what what's that money going to um, we need people who do that I mean when you don't have a robust local journalism sector uh, you get like really <laughs> you end up getting really corrupt local officials. I love, uh, I love this guy. Kelly Lewis, hello. Welcome to the program. I love when you watch the show, uh, Kelly Lewis. A um, lot of folks here on the show. Wild Bill McChenzie, we'll get to your comment here. Do you have any interactions with, with Writer's House from Wild Bill McChenzie watching? You know, I, I don't as of right now, um, but it's not something that's absent from my radar, let me say that. I have really... Um, I've recently actually uh, like learned more about it, and I'm I really would like to get involved. Do you would you ever be a source of local news, or is it more um, creativity that mm. drives you with the with with words? I have actually written a couple of articles for yeah. Siva Weekly, um, been in a couple like simple letters to the editor's page of the Progress. Um, but I care a lot about I know you do issues. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, you probably do. I've seen you. I've seen you comment. <laughs> I, you follow it closely. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I care a lot about it. And when I see something that you know I, I really care about, uh, I have in the past reached out. Um, but the, I mean, the truth is that this is not my full time job yet. You know, I I work for uh, a news organization actually right now. Um, that Can I ask which one? Uh, yeah, I just want to be clear. I'm not here representing. Sure. Uh, I'm not here representing. Ooh, I'm not here representing Politico. Uh, but I work. For, I work in account management there. Nice. Um, and uh, I I would love to be you know more engaged in that way and like putting out my own word in the community, um, in the community that I care so much about. Because dude, you got the talent and the connections and the passion for it. Where I think if you, I mean, a good example of this is Sean Tubbs. Yeah. Um, Sean Tubbs with Town Crier Productions. Um, another good example of this is, is Molly at Socialist Dogma. On Molly Twitter. Conjure. Molly Conjure. She's she, great. Okay, let's, let's highlight both those models. Sure. Um, Neil Williamson, who's watching the program now, is another yeah. good example. Free Enterprise Forum. That's ne right. Neil Williamson Love is, when he's on the show. Is, more, um, is, is more, I would say, almost in the lobbying space. Yeah. where his efforts are backed by fundraising dollars. Mm -hmm. And I think um, Neil is incredible, and he's going to be on Real Talk on Friday with Ned Galloway, Board of Supervisors. I'll make sure to watch. Um, 
Tubbs is legitimately, for example, one example, not indicative of everything, but one example. Sean Tubbs is legitimately allocating hours and hours of his time to property transactions yeah. in the city of Charlottesville and also Albemarle County and highlighting these transactions in aggregate format. Molly, whose handle on Twitter is Socialist Dog Mom, she has hundred, over 100,000 followers on Twitter. It's crazy. It's a massive amount of following. <laughs> yeah. She covers meetings. Local journalism. Like yeah. mundane meetings <laughs> all the way to big time meetings like city council, but all the way to like commission meetings. Yeah. And she does it with, by live tweeting them. Yeah, and and is and pays her bills through Patreon support. I think they're both amazing here. Walk me through anything on your mind on these two models and how I see an opportunity, especially with someone as talented as connected as you, of like creating like a fresh piece of content a day. It's got to be going to have to be damn good it's, content. It's going to have to be good. Yeah, it's going to have. And then either having a paywall or having <laughs> like five or ten underwriters with yeah. their call to action messages around that content. Anywhere you want to go on this. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, the fact that uh, Molly Conjure has been live tweeting city council meetings since I don't even know. Has it been like eight years? A now? long time, yeah. It's been so long. Um, and like, there's, there's no one else doing that. Like, you get to see uh, in real time, like, what is happening in city council um, without having to track down to city hall. Uh, and she's just like, on it every week like that dedication I mean talk about someone who loves her community um, and Sean Tubbs too who I mean again someone who loves his community and I think that's really the core of it I think that's what a lot of local journalists really have in common is is a deep passion for the people that they live around the place that they live in the the history of it the context of it uh, is all very important, um, and it's something that I would love to be able to give my voice to. Uh, as for the exact model of it, I'm, I'm not sure yet. Uh, I really, am, I really don't want to do something, um, you know, like kind of not not give it my all. I really don't want to do it uh, halfway, and to be very like careful about it. I think is also really important. Um, you know, you've said on the show before. Uh, and, and I think I've commented too, like it's better to do something right than to do something fast. And something like this is something that I, I would really want to do right. You um, are impressive, dude. Um, I'm glad the interview is going in this way. Let's highlight his engage um, you know, tendencies in this community. This Danny O'Day guy is our guest. He's the author of Last Man in Cleveland. Judah if, you, Judah, if you can get that on screen again, Last Man in Cleveland, the cover of this fantastic novel that I'm going to read here. Um, I, I want to show you and highlight how engaged this guy is. Um, <laughs> City Council approved a $214 million budget That's right. last, last night. night. Yeah. Your take on this. Anywhere you want to go. Oh, man. Um, I uh, was kind of buckling in for like a nine-hour meeting. They did <laughs> 40 minutes? What was it? That was, that was quick. crazy. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's what happens when you have like 8,000 hours of closed session. Uh, <laughs> so that was, that was shocking. Um, let's see. I mean, a couple of the highlights there. Uh, I mean, they, they, they approved the real estate increase, right? Yeah. The one cent increase. One cent real estate tax rate increase. That's right. Uh, and the, the meal tax. Now, I'm actually not 100% on this. Is that officially approved or has that been tabled? Do That's, you know? That is going to a second, essentially, reading or a second session. That's right. The, the likelihood is the meals tax in the city of Charlottesville will jump half a cent. Yeah. Um, zero, yes. Less than a penny. Half a penny. Half a penny. Right. Um, Making eating out more expensive. The real estate tax rate increase is up one cent. Real estate tax rate increase. Six cents per hundred dollars. Yeah, that's right. right. That's yeah. right. Um, personal property tax rate, they're going to keep the same. So the city of Charlottesville mm -hmm. gets the windfall from assessments on average upticking across the city 11.69%. So that's cash windfall, additional revenue. They get the cash windfall, additional revenue, Danny, of the one cent increase to the tax rate real estate. That's right. And then they get the revenue windfall that comes with the personal property tax rate 
Um, all our vehicles are going to likely be taxed anywhere from 18 to 30 percent more because the yeah. used car market is out of control. It's, Boats included in there, motorcycles included. Oh my god! And then they're going to raise the uh, meals tax half a cent, which is going to be more revenue. All that leads to potential funding for Buford, Buford School reconfiguration. Right. Uh, if you know a lot of ifs here, what makes me really, really nervous is um, you know large scale infrastructure projects that take place kind of on the cusp of a, uh, you know, a risky economic time. Um, I mean, you don't have to look that hard to see the Dewberry Hotel from here. Uh, and that was a large scale infrastructure project that was started at the cusp of a very, very volatile time. Um, and you have, you know, as of last week, Deutsche Bank predicting a massive recession, a contraction of like 25% of the market, 20 to 25% of the market. Um, I don't know. I I can really see uh, a lot of angles to it, though, because uh, you do have you know the, the public schools that are in the community that deserve to be good, right? Like we we value ourselves in this community for being a very educated, a very forward thinking community, and the fact that we have our you know our, our youngest are, are basically the people who, in any given society, we are tasked to raise properly. Um, going to school every day in buildings that are falling apart. I don't know the last time you were in Buford, man. It's not pretty. Um, Have you been in Buford? Uh, I swam at the pool there for like years when I was doing kayak there. And uh, I know it hasn't really been fixed up since then, and it was not looking great then. Um, so I think that, I think that you know, we really do need to be careful about it. Uh, but I don't disagree with the the kind of the motivation behind trying to fix it up. You are a product of Western Admiral Schools. That's right. Um, Western Admiral High School graduate, Wave and Mary graduate here, Danny O'Day. Would you say, you're a millennial, you're 26. That's right, just turned 26. What's the millennial's take on housing? Eventually, I mean, are you a renter? <laughs> Yeah, I'm you a like to buy a house. I'd love to buy a house. Uh, you, know, and you got a take on this? I know you do. <laughs> it's tough. The millennial in two words: millennial take on housing. It is tough, man. It is hard. Um, I mean, people are right now being trapped in uh, the rent cycle. You know, where the people who are buying homes right now, uh, the ones who are succeeding, are being prioritized for cash on hand. Uh, something that you cover a lot in your show, and and. Um, I'm sure all your viewers are very well informed on. Um, but what that means is that people who rent uh, don't have a lot of building uh, liquid equity. Like they, they can't just drop a couple, you know, 20, 30 grand on the drop of a hat. Um, and as a result, people who are going to school because they were told it's like, this is how you have to do it to get a good job, to get a good paycheck. Um, are forced between paying down their student loans uh, or trying to build equity to buy a house. And it's really difficult. I'm, I ask all of your guests who are involved in real estate, uh, I put it in the comments of like every single show for like the last week, um, do they think it's a pipe dream for a first time home buyer to buy a house in this community? And some of them are a little coy, but almost all of them arrive at yes, it is kind of a pipe dream. So what are you gonna do? Because you love Charlottesville, and I'm sure you want to live. I mean, you're 26. You you yeah. you like food. You like some. You like a cold drink. <laughs> yeah, that's right? right. That's right. You and your lady like going out. Absolutely. Um, I'm sure you want to stay close to the the restaurants and the bars and the and, and the breweries. That's right. So what what's the plan? Everyone, go buy the last man in Cleveland. Yeah. The last man. <laughs> <laughs> buy the man's book. Damn it. <laughs> No. Help this man buy a house. <laughs> no, no, seriously. Um, I mean, the goal is, uh, you know, really to, you know, put my nose down and, and do well at my job. My girlfriend is an elementary school teacher, um, so she is, uh, she's working at Greer Elementary. Um, Respect. Yeah, Z95.1 Teacher of the Month of Congratulations. February. Congratulations. Yeah, really proud of her for that. Um, so... You know, we are lucky enough to have two incomes in the family, um, but it's it's tough to try to like really build equity long term. So, um, you know, my focus is right now. I'm in I'm in sales and account management. Um, I'm just trying to do the best I can for my clients, for my partners, uh, and really hope to to build 
um, to build my personal and, and myself and my girlfriend's financial situation to the point where we can be uh, comfortable, we can be stable, and we can really start thinking long-term housing-wise. I love it. How's, um, I know you're not speaking for her, um, how's she's doing with, with, with being a teacher post-pandemic? Throughout the pandemic. I mean, yeah, what, throughout what's the, the conversation pandemic, at right? home like? It's, it's tough. It is, it's hard out there for teachers. Um, you know, it always is, but it is like, it is really hard. And, um, you know, it's just getting, I want to, I want to say it delicately. I want to say it appropriately. Um, obviously everyone who serves in a public office wants to get community feedback. Uh, but there are a lot of national and global narratives that are being spun around right now that makes it very difficult for them to do their jobs. Uh, for example, for example, the I mean, the one that's obviously in all the headlines are teachers who are getting like accosted at uh, school board meetings for critical race theory, for um, for, for like trans rights, LGBTQ rights, uh, for you know should or should they not be wearing a mask, um, and all all this stuff just leads to the teachers who are really there because they want to be teaching. They want to be in front of the kids and helping them, you know, get a better life. And then they come home and are just getting like accosted by the community and it just becomes like I honestly it's the most thankless public service job. I, it just it just makes me sad to see. What did you make of how the the uh the Virginia governor's race played out? I mean, I think we can make a legitimate claim McCulloch may have lost that election with the statements he made about parents and, and they should not be empowered with their children's education. That was Do you agree with that? That he lost because in part, at least in part because of that? In part, absolutely. I mean, I don't think there's any question about it. Um, that, that it definitely played a part. Uh, I honestly, I think he would have lost anyway. You think so? I think so. Because people were just tired of the career politician? People, I mean, he rose to prominence in the... Um, you know, as basically Bill Clinton's best friend in Virginia. Uh, and there were a couple of things that, um, you know, he really could have hammered down on in the race, but, you know, that a, a, a better, I would say, a better candidate could have really hammered down on the race. Um, but, you know, wasn't able to because he himself was also guilty of being the career politician, of being the, um, actually, what was the firm that Youngkin worked at? A uh, private equity firm. I'll figure that out for you. Yeah. Um, Youngkin's, like, network. He was the CEO. Yeah. Uh, was, like, at the time of the race. Was I think like, it's the Carlisle Group. That's right. Yeah. It was the Carlisle yeah, the Carlisle Group. Carlisle Group. Yeah. And, like, Youngkin, Youngkin's net worth from that was, like, four or $500 million. And I think a, a better candidate could have said, these are really troubling economic times. Do you want someone who is, like, spitting at a billion to be the person who is in charge of your economic situation. But he couldn't, because McAuliffe worked at the Carlisle Group too and took hundreds of millions of dollars from it for his campaign. So it was, it was a tough race. I don't think that McAuliffe would have won either way. You are, dude, you are good in the setting here. You are clearly um, extremely educated and well-read. You're, you're 26, you're a millennial. That's right. Often the age demographic, the bracket that you're a part of, is very pro-Democrat in voting. That's right. Is that the case now? How do you, and I know you can't speak for an entire bracket. Yeah, right. Okay, <laughs> just go you personal. How, how do you feel, how do you identify politically these days? Um, that's really hard. I would say that a lot of millennials uh, are incredibly disenfranchised by the system. We have, I mean, think, think, about, think about when millennials basically started having like a functioning memory, right? Um, we jumped from 9-11 to the Great Recession uh, through um, the first Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, throughout the Afghanistan and Iraqi wars uh, into the Syrian civil war, the COVID outbreak, and now we're staring at a housing market that we will, honestly, a lot of us never reach financial stability. Uh, and I think it's hard for us to hear, just vote, it'll get better over and over again when 
it doesn't. It just seems to not trend that way. That's a great take. That's a sizzle reel. Please mark that timestamp. My question to Danny's answer. So how do we fix it? And let's keep the sizzle reel going with this take that he's going to offer here. I mean, <laughs> this is you talking. You're not speaking for a group. Yeah. I mean, not getting engaged is probably not the way to fix it. I no. understand the disenfranchised and dis disheartened. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the Ds. Demoralized, yeah. <laughs> disturbed, disgusted, depressed. That's right. Know, all the Ds. I mean, alliteration can continue if we'd like. Um, how do we fix it? I, I've often spoken about the value proposition of the third party, mm -hmm. which I don't know yeah. will become a reality in, in the near future, but the need for the third party, these polar opposite parties where the line in the sand is, is drawn and social media is creating this divisive community even more, exasperating it. Yeah, honestly, when I was, I remember growing up and everyone like- This is Crozet? Yeah, yeah, growing, Crozet? growing up in like Crozet and I, I grew up in Ivy. Um, so I remember growing up and like everyone screaming about social media, like it's going to break everyone's brains and, uh, I rolled my eyes, but now I'm like, Oh man, <laughs> I, think right? I, I think I might've broke everyone's brains. Um, I, I mean, the truth is I'm not, I don't know how to fix it. Uh, there are a lot of problems and I think we have built a system that, uh, is uniquely unable to deal with intersecting problems, problems that you know are affected by a lot of different things. Um, like, like you take something like, um, like the like a crime rate statistic, and you can say uh, like past thinking would be very simple. It's like okay, the crime is going up. The solution is that we need to. Um, you know, put more police there. Tie it to your take on police locally. Seriously, tie it to that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sure. Um, the, the I mean, the truth is that um, there are a lot of factors that go into a crime rate, and things that you know we don't think about every day. Things like uh, things like an increase of lead in the infrastructure of an underfunded community uh, is linked so directly to a high crime rate. Uh, that to the point that sociologists are lead in paint, lead in paint, lead in pipes uh, are linked so closely that sociologists now are crediting the uh, replacement of lead paint with the massive crime drop that happened in New York in the 80s and the 90s. That they're saying like they can be tied to like three years after the lead paint was gone, crime just nosedive. And they're saying that like the lead like really had more to do with it than just about anything else. Uh, and you know what exacerbates the lead in paint is uh, consistently high temperatures, which we were seeing more and more. And so that intersects with it. And because uh, the quality of schools is tied to property rates, uh, a building that was built in the 50s with lead paint and is in an underfunded community. Buford. Probably isn't going to be going to the best school. And... As a result, you have all of these confluence of events that are coming together to affect like a single issue. And we have such a hard time dissecting the nuances of those issues. And I think that's the most important part is that we really need to look at it uh, that way. And we know a couple of things are true, uh, that a robust local um, education program is directly tied to a lower crime rate. If we invest in the future of our children, they won't grow up to be committing crimes. Like, it, it's very simple. Um, and that is something that's really, really, really important. Uh, and when you look at the ratios of localities, I mean, certainly, like, we need, we need peacekeepers. We need police officers who are there and keeping the peace, make sure the community is safe. But if the goal is a long-term reduction in crime, we should be really thinking about how we're spending our education dollars as well, like in every conversation. Um, I really do believe that the education is a silver bullet to this. Uh, I've, I've believed that for a very long time. Your take on, because uh, we've corresponded to this via Messenger DM mm -hmm. on the police budget. That's right. We don't, we don't uh, necessarily agree on this one, but I still think your take is back with... Um, with reasoning. Um, offer your take on this. Yeah, so the budget currently allocates uh, local spending at about $477,000 uh, 
um, total for resources, salary, for um, probably to like pay property value, like everything. About four hundred forty, about four hundred seventy-seven thousand um, dollars per police officer. And he's talking city for the city. Sorry, for the city yeah. of Charlottesville, and about seventy-two thousand dollars in the same metric for teachers. Um, and I understand that, that that you know the education budget does get funding from a federal and a state level, uh, but that's still a discrepancy of about four hundred thousand uh, dollars. And the long term, I mean, I've I've talked to police officers, I've had police officers in my family who I love very dearly and respect, and uh, a lot of them, I mean, that I've talked to would agree that. Uh, you know, after school programs that are well funded and well resourced, that, you know, teachers who aren't pulling their hair out when they go to bed every night, uh, being able to fund like those kind of programs for, for children is, you know, how you long term reduce the crime rate. Uh, it would make their job easier, honestly. It would make the police officer's job easier to have a more robust funding for the education. Do you, do you, Scott Bandy just shared the post. Scott Bandy, I love when you watch the program, man. Um, are you bullish on Charlottesville City? I'm gonna outline some things and then your take. Okay. Dude, you have exceeded my expectations. I'm I glad swear to God, exceeded my expectations. Um, here's my outline. You go anywhere you want. I'm going to go, I'm a positive guy. We're both positive guys. I feel I you're think a positive so. guy. Yeah. Yeah. We're both positive <laughs> guys. Um, so positive first, UVA's here. Yeah. We have huge protection from macro trends because of the University of Virginia. Absolutely. Um, positive guy. Quality of life is great here. Oh, There's a hell of a lot of stuff that we can do. People want to move here to enjoy that tremendous opportunity from a quality of life standpoint. Um, positive guy. The cost of living in comparison to Northern Virginia and Manhattan, mm -hmm. um, in comparison to some other these other bigger cities in the Mid Atlantic and East Coast, is still somewhat manageable. Yeah. Okay. Positive guy. Um, restaurants. Yeah. Um, positive guy. Um, <laughs> when it when it's all said and done, the crime rate is pretty pretty darn good. Yeah. Okay. Pretty good. Negative guy. Okay, right. here comes negative. Let's hear the cons. Housing, obscenely expensive. Oh, God. 10.2 um, square miles. Where else is the housing going to go? Yeah. We're only going to have to build up. Not a lot we, of we, we, we're, we're landlocked. Um, potential negative, also UVA. <laughs> um, bringing more people here, students in the fall than ever before. Data science school is about to open. I'm telling you, the data science school is going to dramatically change gonna this community. Big, it's going to be big. So, so bullish or bearish on City of Charlottesville, Danny O'Day. All right, so I think that you touched on two things that I would like to kind of put together. Okay. Uh, you touched on quality of life and okay. you touched on cost of living. Okay. Now, I don't know if there is, like if there is someone in the comments, that'd be fantastic. If there is like a, some sort of metric that like puts those two at a ratio, like what is the quality of life rate versus what is the cost of living rate? And I think to the benefit of Charlottesville for the last 20 years, the quality of life has far exceeded the cost of living. What I'm worried about is that the cost of living is starting to catch up. And I think once there is a tipping point where the cost of living is higher than the quality of life, um, then people are going to start saying, why would I live in a place that's as expensive as Charlottesville when I could live in an equally expensive place and uh, be in D.C., be in Richmond, be in Charlotte. Um, and I think that is something that we have to really pay attention to. I mean, you're absolutely right. The quality of life here is off the charts. Uh, and what I've often said for people, I'm like, why did I move back? Because the quality of life versus the cost of living is unmatched. I have been very fortunate in my life. Um, I've had the opportunity to visit a lot of places, a lot of very beautiful places that I loved very much. But for examples, for example, um, for example, I've gotten to go to Greece and spend a couple, uh, spend some time in Santorini. I've gotten to live in Denver for a little while. I lived in D.C. for a while. Um, my family's from New York, so I know the New York City and the Long Island area very, very well. Um, and I, I've been very fortunate to see these places. 
but what I've never been able to reconcile is how good we have it here versus how much we spend for it. Uh, I was paying like uh, $1,100 a month uh, with a roommate. I know I can't remember how much he was paying uh, for an apartment in D.C. before I moved back to Charlotte. You each have your own room? We each had our own room. Okay. Uh, so it was a two bedroom. I was paying eleven hundred. He had a bigger bedroom, so he was probably like fourteen or thirteen or something like. What that. year is that? Uh, Twenty nineteen. Okay. Um, that was before we moved. My girlfriend and I moved back down um, last summer. So we moved back down, and all of a sudden, I'm paying uh, my share of a seventeen hundred dollar rent uh, in Tenth and Page, walkable. To I walked here, walkable to everything. I could want to do walkable to breweries to restaurants to rooftop bars and I'm paying like $500 less in rent per month than I was in DC and I was like how is this even possible um, but the truth is that that ratio is not stagnant and is starting to tilt in the favor of cost of living and if we want to be uh, bullish on Charlottesville we have to make sure that the quality of life is higher than the cost of living. Um, that's, Great take. Yeah, that's going to come down to housing. Like you are always talking about, it's the amount of units. It's the amount of units. It's the inventory. It's where can people live. You are uh, hottest neighborhood in Charlottesville? I personally believe it's 10th and Page. It's a little bit skewed, a uh, little bit biased because I live there. Um, but it is a beautiful, historic neighborhood uh, with you know pinpointed in between... West Main Street in the dairy market. Uh, I can walk from my front door and be at four or five different bakeries within 10 minutes. <laughs> I could be at um, you know, any number of coffee shops, any number of restaurants that have James Beard award-winning chefs like from my front door and be there in 10 minutes. Uh, tenth of page is beautiful. Gosh, dude, Danny O'Day is crushing it right now um you uh you saw our our iconic buildings list and you had uh you had some qualms with it you you thought we missed a couple that's right i did think you missed a couple uh the tavern and grocery building yeah oh my god that building's what 120 years old. historic landmark that's a good one oh my god it's beautiful and then you go in and uh i mean the basement but that i mean Beautiful. I love that. Lost Saint Bar, the cocktail yeah, bar? Yeah, the Lost Saint. Man, that place is special. Um, we designed that logo. Remember, Judah? Oh, Lost yeah. Saint. Did that really? logo was created in this building. No As way. was the logo for Tavern and Grocery. We created it right here in this building. Those two. That might be my favorite restaurant in town. It's Dynamite, I believe. And, and help me, Judah. Um, Danny, you may be able to help me here. Was it Inge's Grocery? It was, yeah, before it was... I-N-G-E, I believe. I-N-G-E, yeah. yeah. Historic Landmark African American Grocery. That's right. Um, That's right. If you see the plaque outside Tavern and Grocery, mm-hmm. it commemorates the history of the building. That's a damn good one that should be on there. What else did you think we missed? I thought you missed the, uh, the Amtrak station slash former Wild Wings. Mm-hmm. I love that building. It is I a great a building. a lot of great memories watching... UVA basketball back in the the Dave Lato era in that building. Um, Love, love, love that building. And, you know, whomever is able to take it over, um, I feel like it's probably going to be like a brewery or or just like a massive sports bar or something, Um, is going to be very lucky. They're going to have a phenomenal space. What is, so you spend time in Boulder and Denver Mm -hmm. and Greece and D.C. You grew up in Crozet. Mm -hmm. You went to school at William & Mary. What What is Charlottesville missing? Besides inventory and housing. <laughs> Besides inventory and housing? Um, I mean, a, uh, a nice cheap sports bar. I yeah, really- <laughs> dude. For real. for real. I thought I really was pulling for that for um, Mangione's spot. Yeah. Uh, do you know what's going to be there? I just saw a sign today for the first time. There's a sign up front that says, Smyrna coming soon. Are you doing really? Danny O'Day breaking some news. <laughs> this is news to me. Did you know this? We're yeah. going to see, we may be putting this on the I Love Seville Network, and if we do, we got to give credit to Danny O'Day, the author of Last Man in Cleveland. What did the sign say? Smyrna, S-M-Y-R-N-A. It says Smyrna coming soon. It had a picture of a giant squid on it. It looked cool. It looked cool. I'm not sure what it's going to be, though. S-M-Y-R-N-A. I think it's a Greek word, but Smyrna I'm Smyrna sure. was a Greek city located at a strategic point on the, what's, is it Aegean coast? Aegean, yeah. Aegean yeah, yeah, yeah. coast. Um... 
get out of town. Freaking Danny O'Tain breaking some news <laughs> over here. So we got a potential new restaurant tenant in the old Mangione spot. That's right. That's what it looks like. Um, personally, I thought it'd be a perfect spot for a sports bar. I was like, this is this is central. Uh, it's far enough away from the corner that it might not get flooded with the UVA students. Uh, it'd be perfect for locals to come and have a drink. Uh, but you know what? I mean, if it's going to be a place that specializes in Greek food, I love Greek food. I love I mean, Greek what's food. What's wrong with that? That's perfect. Uh, so I'm just excited to see something going in there. I love Mangione's. I'm excited to see that place uh, open up again. Well said. Uh, Bill McChenzie, Booker T. Washington, slept at Inges. Um, oh, he's awesome. highlighting that. That's awesome. I he also that. says the cost of property taxes is dramatically impacting this community. John Blair, um, city attorney over in Stanton watching the program. We love you, John Blair. I cannot wait to get you on this program, John Blair. Hopefully we can do that soon, my friend. Um, Jennifer, this interview has been absolutely fantastic, Jerry. Please ask your guest what else he thinks that Charlottesville would need. Ooh, she man. highlights the need for improved transportation. You know, I firmly believe that public transportation uh, can really, really make or break a good community. Um, I think having, first of all, having like a walkable city infrastructure, a place that, you know, that, that people can gather and communicate. And, and I mean, you want to put the door downtown too, which I like am all on board with as well. Hey, can I say that's what's missing? Oh my gosh, thank you, please. <laughs> I don't understand why we don't do this. Danville's beating us, Danny O'Day. Oh, I know. I know. It drives me crazy. Um, but yeah, public and uh, public transportation infrastructure. I mean, people have this belief that like if, if a bus isn't filled, then it's not succeeding. Uh, but how about this? Let's change our paradigm on that a little bit. Uh, a bus is about the length of two cars. If it has three people in it, it is succeeding, right? That is three drivers off the road. That is a safer road by that much. That is less exhaust. That is less pollution. That is less mileage. That's less cost to the average person who's living here. If we can change the way that we think about public transportation and say that, okay, if it's got three people on that bus, it is doing its job, then we have a very successful public transportation system. Dude, Danny O'Day, boys and girls, you have five hours in Charlottesville with friends from outside the community. Danny O'Day, where are you taking your homies? Five hours only to spend in Charlottesville or Almore County or Almore Central County. Virginia. That's right. Where are you taking them in this five-hour jaunt? That's right. So this was actually a question that was... It's a great question. It's, it's a great, great cocktail question. party question. Isn't it? Yeah. It's um, a great question. It was a question that was poised to me by, uh, by a colleague of mine who's coming into town this weekend. And... She wanted to know, wanted to hit like three places. Uh, and she wanted King Family to be one of them. Okay. Um, which honestly would have been on my list either way. Love King Family. Uh, I, gave, I gave her three options. I want to hear your thoughts. I gave her uh, two options. Okay. Um, one that is like mostly in Crozet so you can get more hours per place. Okay. I did King Family, Pro Renata, and Veritas. Those were my three. Pretty That's, good three. Those are damn good. Right? Yeah. Uh, and the other one that I said that, um, you know, for my money, best quality if, like, you're getting drinks, you know, you've got a driver and everything. King Family, uh, Potter's Cidery, love Potter's, and Three Notched. Uh, those are those are my other option. That's less time per place. But, like, you're getting top-tier quality at every place you go to. That's, that's great stuff. I'd go Three Notch is, uh, is, is one of my favorite brands. Bar on the Minute Man's my love favorite it. beer. The Ghost is my wife's favorite beer. Um, we love the local. Oh, yeah. And Belmont. We love uh, Moss. And we love um, Maya. Mm. Those three restaurants are absolutely fantastic. I'm super passionate about the downtown mall. Oh, yeah. Um, Can't miss it. Somewhere on the mall. Um, so if I had five hours and my guests only had five hours, I would probably do a little crawl from mm -hmm. Mas Tapas for Sangria, Bacon Ooh, Wrap yeah. Dates, Tomatoes oh, Asados, man. to a martini and the... Uh, and the the mushroom uh, di the mushroom dish at the local. Mm. From there, a crawl to the local for some Minuteman and to ghosts. Then I'd head to the downtown mall yeah. for a steakhouse burger at Citizen and an IPA. Oh, and I would man. finish it with um, Danny O'Day's favorite tavern and grocery in Los <laughs> Saint for a cocktail, and then go see Ted Norris at Maya um, for a cocktail at the bar, and we walk him to the Amtrak. <laughs> Um, to get on the train for wherever, wherever they're going. We don't drive anywhere. We walk the whole way. I love that. That is a, That'd be a great, great answer. That is a great crawl. Is, uh, 
the rooftop at Passive Flora. Is that open yet? I don't. That's a great question. Do we know if Hunter Smith's Passive Flora is open? Can you check on that, J Dubs? And get, it might be on their Facebook page. They've been doing some construction They've up there. They've been doing a lot of construction. Um, how about this? The innovators of Charlottesville or Almoral that you've been most impressed with. Oh my gosh! Um, the Hunter Smith one got me thinking because yeah, he's got right? the uh, the bruise. Um, what was it called? The High Street one. Um, yeah. Bruise on High Street, which um, we think it's going to be kind of like the Outer Banks um, brew through yeah, 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 scenario. Yeah. What about um, the the group that's behind Brasserie Saison? Hunter Smith. Hunter Smith. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Then absolutely Hunter Smith. Um, I mean, can we count like Robeck as a local brand? Yeah. I saw, I saw a Robeck at the Masters the other day. Robeck guys birthed at the Darden School. They were they were wearing Robeck at the Masters. Like I don't know if it was sponsored. If the guy just liked the shirt, I'm trying to remember who the golfer was. But that is like blowing up. Talk about a national uh, national brand that was built local. That Robeck is everywhere. Yeah. You yeah. wear what's the shirt you got on there? Oh, this I picked up in uh, New Orleans actually. Okay, it's nice. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Are you a Robeck guy? Um, I. It's honestly a little bit outside my price range, it's, man. It's I'm trying cheap. to save for that house. Yeah. Uh, my dad loves Robeck. Okay. Like if if just everyone got him a Robeck shirt for his birthday, just be a happy all, guy. I mean, there are five kids in my family, so if he just got five Robecks, he'd be like perfect birthday. Close on, <laughs> dude. You just filled 70 minutes. This guy's crushed it. Um, Danny O'Day is the author of Last Man in Cleveland. Before we we close with this. Um, your perspective for 20-somethings, millennials in Charlottesville and, and surviving this crazy world we're in. I want you to close with a take on that. But before you give us that take on that, how can everyone buy The Last Man in Cleveland? Judah, get it on screen. Where can we buy this? How can we enjoy an amazing book? I can't wait to read this. While potentially helping uh, a stakeholder in the community become a first-time home buyer. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, it's available, I mean... Basically anywhere you buy books. It's on Amazon. It's on Barnes & Noble. Uh, it's on my publisher's website, CuriousCorvid.com. It's going to be, uh, if you want to come and meet me, I'm going to be at Mudhouse uh, from 5.30 to 7 on April 28th, sponsored by Bluebird Bookstop. Um, and if I could throw a plug towards them, uh, the ladies there are, are incredible. They're doing amazing things for the community. Crozet has been needing a bookstore for a long time. They're filling that gap. Uh, love what they're doing out there and you can buy it through their website so if you want to throw them a buck or two they're a local business that really are doing amazing things fantastic your uh, take on millennials surviving this crazy ecosystem <laughs> um, you know keep your chin up find your community really rely on them uh, you know build your network of people that you trust and care about um, and and keep them close they're going to support you no matter what Danny O'Day killed it today absolutely killed it um, follow him on social. We'll wel welcome him back on the program, and I will personally read his book, The Last Man in Cleveland, and, yeah. and offer some perspective on it on the show. Dude, thank you. Thank you. Sincerely. Thank you. I really appreciate sincerely, it. Sincerely, thank you. Blast, thank man. you. Um, Judah Wickhauer's director. My name is Jerry Miller. This is the I Love Seville show. Today, presented by Greenberry's Coffee Roasters, Skuma Boutique Dispensary, Scott Wagner Sports Medicine, um, and just the best local businesses and brands. Our Wednesday afternoon show, What's Barking Local, presented by Animal Connection, is up in one hour and 20 minutes. Are we highlighting the SPCA today? No, it's, uh, it's Yvonne it's and Yvonne, Coco's birthday today. So we're going to so. be uh, having a birthday celebration for the best-dressed dog in Central Virginia <laughs> at 3 o'clock. Literally, that's going to happen. Uh, thank you kindly for joining us, guys. We'll see you in one hour and 20 minutes. Take care. Danny, well done. He's going to tell us when the mics are off air. Awesome.